So welcome uh, everybody to another Deep Adaptation Q&A. And uh, this month, I'm very pleased that we have Anisha Gardiali joining me. And uh, this is interesting for me because, uh, in particular, because Anisha uh, is the first person who interviewed me about Deep Adaptation after my Deep Adaptation paper came out. And it was, um, yeah, I, I didn't really know how to talk about it. I, I was really quite reticent about talking about it. I was still in my own processing, shock, grief, reworking what, what should I really be doing now? How should I be living? And so Amisha was uh, amazing in the way that she, she held me in that moment uh, for her podcast, which is uh, The Future is Beautiful. And uh, I wondered how our interview would actually go given the fact the nature of her podcast and the, the title of it and and yet we we explored uh things which i think therefore were really helpful for me just that interview helping me really connect with what i still believe in what's still beautiful for me so it's really super to reconnect what is it almost 18 months on uh amisha uh, mm. thank you for joining it's absolutely my pleasure and i was re-listening to the interview last night and yeah, feeling what a journey, because as we were talking about it, it was very much you were saying that when we'd gone to the green school, that was the third group of people that you talked about it. And then here we are 18 months later and there's an entire movement. There's been so many events and, and many, many, many people around the world know what deep adaptation is. Mm. And it's yeah, been thanks. one of the most popular episodes of the podcast as well. Yeah, so I mean, your podcast is incredible. For those of you who don't know, Amisha, for it's over 80 interviews now you've done, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. uh, really interesting thinkers, some of whom are well known, and some people that I'd never heard of before they featured on your, on your pod, uh, and really going deep into people's worldviews and motivations uh, in ways that you don't often hear. Um, so yeah, I recommend it. Future is beautiful. I suppose you just go to iTunes and type in future is beautiful. Is that right? Yeah, you can okay. find it. iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, um, or we have a website, thefutureisbeautiful.co. Yeah. And I think actually seeing, I can't remember what happened. Someone sent me the YouTube video of our audio and it had, it had thousands of views. And there was another indication that this was beginning to take off and become the kind of movement that it now clearly is. So yeah. So thank you for joining. So, Amisha, you've 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 given this. This was your decision. Some was a, some two three years ago now to really explore uh, people's ideas about uh, outside of the matrix. You know what 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 can the future? What does the future look and feel like? And where we can see those seeds now. So you've been having amazing conversations now with many people from around the world. So I'm, and I'm really interested in how there's this, in many of them, you touch on this question of inner and outer. It's this sort of, these people are actually engaged in trying to do good in the world, but are also very clear that, that their own personal journey, uh, their own uh, spiritual practices, are important that often comes up. So I was thinking, is this is is this is this a reflection of yourself and what's important to you? Uh, and what is it that I think is really that you think is really important for us to know about you um, in the work that you do? Yeah, thank you for the question. I I started this. And it started in a slightly different framing, but actually still very relevant, where we had an election year in the UK and I was feeling like the times of trusting a politician and a political party to create the vision of the future that we choose was no longer the way that the system worked. And so how important it was for each one of us 
to connect deeper to our values. So not like individualism, like, but more we are all important. We're all part of the unfolding story. And whatever it is that we spend our time, our money, our energy on is creating the future, whether we understand that or not. And that was the origins of the project. And so I had all these fun ways of getting people to engage with that question. What is the future you choose? And interestingly, it turned out to be a question that many people found very difficult to answer, which led me into much deeper processes around it. And we had a book and uh, a few years ago, I started the podcast because I felt like quite often our world is very siloed and we present certain parts of ourselves, which means that our understanding of people and what drives people gets quite warped. So for example, you know, I mean, maybe I can use you as an example, Gem, but you know, for years you were sharing about sustainability and you show a professional side of yourself. So a lot of people that you come into contact with will only know that side of yourself. And then, and that's the same for, for everyone in whatever kind of professions that, we're in, that they're in. And so we're often getting these very siloed understandings of people. And I feel that that then in turn makes us more siloed because we feel like there isn't permission for all of these other parts of ourselves and actually how holistic and integrated we really are as human beings, but also not just as human beings, but as communities, as networks, as society. And for me, one of the things that felt really important was to offer a space that allowed people to be as big and dynamic and whole as they are and share the inner world as well as what they're doing in the world and why they're doing it and, and really make those connections because I think that that's the part that we can often all really connect with. Sometimes it's hard to connect with a theory or an idea of something that we should do. But when you hear someone talking about you know, those really deep moments that influence them um, or what keeps them up late at night and you realize it's the same things that keep you up late at night, it's easier then to make behavior changes and take more responsibility or give yourself permission to be more of who you are. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I really appreciated that as, as someone you interviewed, that you really tuned into the personal journey and, uh, and as I've spent more time on this deep adaptation topic, I think that's become so clear that we do self-censor in a culture, culture of mutual censorship of a myriad of emotions, um, uncertainties, uh, and uh, yeah, it's that professional face, um, wanting to appear clever, in control, have the answers, um, fear of being vulnerable about about uh, in front of others uh and it then it kind of then means that we don't have an inquiring culture um we have really stupid pronouncements for example on the most recent um concern affecting humanity right now with the coronavirus you can see that there's just this um so thin veneer of of, of confidence which which just doesn't really help so i'm wondering what 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 do you, to what extent do you think that inner suppression that inner alienation is involved in causing our environmental predicament uh, amongst other problems in society i i just don't think we can separate the 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 two things at all like I really feel that if if we were allowed to if it was culturally normal to to bring our whole selves into the workplace into our decision making we would just live in a very different world if if people showed up to work as 
a father, as a brother, as a friend, as all of those like, aspects of, of how they might be in other parts of their lives rather than as like an employee that makes decisions based on a certain set of criteria. If we were allowed to bring those things together, we'd just make different decisions because we'd see each other as humans rather than whatever the, the, you know, the set of data is that we're working to in our, in our workplaces. And I think that living in a world that is so, so siloed and so confusing it, it creates an extraordinary level of distortion where our values our like true human values and our behavior are so different. And that hurts like every single individual for themselves. It's a painful thing to live with. But then when it comes to like the wider way in which society runs, it, if we feel disconnected to how that is because it doesn't really give space for who we are and for what's really important to us, then we all become so disconnected and numb. And, and you know, and we see that in the, in the, the mental health statistics that we have in how lonely and isolated people are feeling in the rise of many diseases, you know, diabetes, these kind of things, which are, often from not having those kind of self-care and community care tools like readily available to us. So this is, um, this is a big part of your, your own personal work um, as, as a yogi, as a coach and so forth. It's that um, tuning into that inner world and helping people connect with that and, and, and be more comfortable in exploring and expressing that. Is that right? And, and are you, can you tell us about how, how well, maybe even in your own, in your own um, personal story, your own journey yeah. with that and how that's influencing your choices in being active, engaged and changing things in, in society? Yeah, for sure. So, Jem, I feel like when we first met, I, w- we w- I was working in sustainable fashion and um, I, I, I've always been very like ambitiously like driven to like make the world a better place. And I did it in a way where partly also because of the, the kind of organizations that I started to work for were very underfunded. And so there was just, I, I kind of, I learned in my early twenties how to burn myself out through my like care of the world. And in my life journey, I had turned to I guess I turned to my kind of spirituality only in moments of real crisis rather than in an everyday kind of sense. So as a, I've always been very kind of spiritually connected, but was also quite embarrassed about it for a number of years because it wasn't kind of culturally accepted. Uh, it, It wasn't, I didn't grow up with a community around my spirituality. And actually I grew up with, the kinds of like friends and people around me that look down on spirituality. And so there were a few moments where it, it really, really supported me. Like when I was 21, I was driven over by a four wheel drive pickup truck and um, I had some, obviously some damage to my legs. I had one tire go over my hair and the other one go over my um, thighs. And I had quite a healing process after that which interestingly a lot of it was um around the trauma rather than around the the physical trauma it was kind of around the emotional trauma and at that time i really turned to my yoga and i went to different kind of healers that were able to help me to work with the pain in the way that the physio wasn't and again a few years later one of my closest friends um she got hit by a car and killed in front of me whilst I'd gone to visit her for the weekend. And that was obviously a huge, a huge life-changing moment for me. And again, it really connected me to my spirituality and I, I stopped drinking. I stopped like, you know, doing a lot of the things that culturally people around me in, in the worlds that I was living in and working in did. And I really turned inwards and I, and I, and I went to, to teachers, you know, I, I, 
I wanted to understand like, what does death mean? Why did this happen? You know, where's she gone? Why was I there? Is this my fault? You know, and all of these questions that I had. And I went to many different teachers. I started to read many different books about death. I really changed my lifestyle. And, and I came to peace with it. And, um, and not only peace, I came to see like, okay, what was the gift in this? And, you know, I kind of understood that her soul was free in, in that and, and, um, and was able to kind of find my way through this, this horrible tragedy. And, and then of course, what happened was I got back into London and I was working for the Ethical Fashion Forum. I was working for the Impact Hub. I was doing The Future is Beautiful in its early carnations. I didn't have enough money because none of these roles were paying me properly. I was out all the time. I started to like socially drink wine with everyone that I worked with because there was a lot of that. And I started to feel myself burning out again. And, and then I had a moment where I actually got glandular fever, which is not something that people in their twenties normally get. And it, um, and the funny thing is, is I didn't really know I had glandular fever and I was lying on the floor before doing a TEDx talk um, on the future we choose, uh, which was the, the book version of, of the podcast. And it was, and I, I had no energy in my body because I had glandular fever. I didn't know I had glandular fever at this point. I just knew that I kept getting sick and I kept pushing through being sick. And and I remember I was lying on the floor and the people that were hosting the TEDx talk were terrified <laughs> that I was going to mess up the event. And I was like, no, no, I'm just saving energy. And then, and then I got up and I, I did the talk and the talk was fine. Um, it's not perfect, but it was okay. And, and then I realized after that I had glandular fever. And I realized how I pushed myself so much, even though I'd had glandular fever all from this motivation of wanting to make the world a better place. And that was ridiculous <laughs> and completely unnecessary. And, and, you know, and I, you know, I was, I, I was doing similar things to what the, the people five years older than me, 10 years older than me that, that I was working around were doing. And um, it wasn't it wasn't completely bonkers the way that I was living, but it wasn't good for my body or my soul, and I wasn't doing my best work. And that led me to just making this very clear decision that I would make my spirituality the core of my life, and that everything else would come from that. And for me, spirituality it doesn't have to mean like a set of practices and dogma and and any of that. It's just that the sort of recognition that we're all connected, it's a recognition that there is a sacred element to being here, to being in this body. It's a remembrance to connect with the earth and the sky. It's a remembrance to, to find like the, the, the greater parts of ourselves. I wanna say like the, the parts of ourselves that is beyond the ego and the part of ourself that, that knows what to do, you know, and I feel like that's really key at this time, that we're all more connected to ourselves as souls so that we understand why we're here and we're able to listen to our intuition so that we know what to do because it, it doesn't look like a time that we've ever known before. And we know that the authorities that we've been giving our power away to in different ways don't have the answers. And so for me, spirituality was, was that it, and, it, and, and taking care of myself as well and creating a relationship with myself. And, and actually in the, height of, in the height of my kind of workaholicisms and, um, and kind of burnout period, the, the ideas, they just come so fast and there was such urgency and I didn't have the capacity to sit with anything, to digest anything and to, to make like clear and concise steps forward. I didn't know how to be with myself. Um, even before in those moments of crisis, I'd found spirituality, but it had been about leaning on others that were 
understanding and compassionate and could could open up and like and you know receive me in my grief uh which i was finding that that my friends or the people around me didn't know how to do and um and so for me a big part of, of that that spiritual journey is being able to sit with yourself being able to sit with all of your thoughts being able to sit in 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 the quietness being able to really kind of enjoy on a very very deep sense like who you are and why you're here and when you cultivate a relationship with yourself that's that strong then so much becomes possible what you're able to hold for other people just by being yourself um i think is world changing and i um hmm. yeah i it, thank you it, it, and then i got into this work and I, I never intended to do this for work, but of course, you know, there's that kind of saying that when the student's ready, the teachers appear. And then of course, sure enough, I met this incredible mystic that, um, that basically just kind of gave me an, a nudge, like um, quite a harsh nudge that opened up things that were sitting there that had been there. They'd been on the surface. Sometimes they'd crept out of this into the world. A lot of the times I've been terrified of them, they've been hidden. And he just helped me to open up a, a lot of things in myself. And, and then I, you know, I, I'd been practicing yoga, but I started to really practice yoga and meditation. And then I did a lot of different trainings and I started to hold space. And, and my, my intention was actually to take these practices back into the world of social change and change making and social entrepreneurship. But then I found that actually everyone was too busy and they said they didn't have time to <laughs> come to yoga mm. or learn to meditate. Um, and then sort of through the podcast, I, I found a space where I could draw the, the connection between these things together. And um, another aspect of my work is that I, I work with clients one-on-one -on -one in helping to set up practices that really work for their lifestyle and where they're at and what they need, but also working on the subconscious patterning that is actually what we what what it takes our, our thoughts and how we live and um, there's some really interesting work in the field of epigenetics which shows that you know around 95 percent of our thoughts are coming from our subconscious which is mostly formed between the third month that we're uh, the third trimester that we're in the uterus and the age of seven and the so we have our conscious mind which we're cultivating through our intellect and through what we learn and through who we think we are but that's actually not as strong as what was already formed and so so many of our thoughts and emotions are coming from that space and a lot of it is often limiting and self-sabotaging it's really interesting when you think that everyone that we know is running these programs and you know there are certain politicians for example that we see a lot of on the tv and you, you can actually see the seven-year-old in them quite strongly but we're all doing that no matter how good we are at, at disguising it so yeah. i started to work a lot with clients on how we actually shift those patterns yeah. and for me that's a, a pathway into greater sovereignty which is how we are able to to move forward as humanity thank you that was really really wonderful to hear your journey and how it all sort of clicks into place um i'm thinking the kind of spirituality you've talked about is is one that i now know is has the longest heritage uh, and has incredible wisdom teachings and practitioners and related to it but is still fairly marginal in in when people think about spirituality it's like it's because you've described one which is very much looking inward uh it's self-acceptance it's it's being with the the inner difficulties uh, rather than just having some kind of quick fix through believing in something so it's that it's that contemplative tradition i think that you're sort of drawing upon there and i'm wondering um i i, I feel that this is, and also the, you've, you've connected there to some of the latest science as well. And uh, I feel that this is hugely needed right now as uh, people around the world are going to be facing 
ever more troubling uh, changes in their lives and news about about threats and, and and feeling that vulnerability and and we've seen it yeah you mentioned it i mean uh, it's not just happening at the level of donald trump just seeming to con- like a, a consciously or unconsciously operate from fear in terms of let's just have a simplistic answer something i can say that's bold and actually isn't super intelligent in, in where the real risk is but but we see that, I mean, uh, I've seen that in organizations as well, people just wanting to look like they're in control rather than ex- exploring things deeply. So how, how some people call this um, sort of cultivating personal or emotional self-regulation. How, how do we, is it possible to do something to bring this uh, rapidly uh, into societies to scale up the contemplative path uh, to help people be with that emotional difficulty so that they can, as you mentioned there, find their sovereignty, act from their own. And also, as you mentioned, tune into that intuition in them about um, as well, rather than all that shutting down that we've been doing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it goes back to, to school, you know, if we were able to teach our kids this stuff, which actually a lot of them, they, they naturally do. And then we kind of teach them how not to do it. And we learn all this stuff that then when you get to this place as an adult, you've got to sort of unlearn everything that you learned and, and then actually learn, okay, how do I, how, how do I actually show up in, in my relationships, whether it's with my colleagues or with my, with my romantic partners or with my family and, and so I feel like the education part is a huge part of this and um, how we can actually bring this into schools and then, of course, into workplaces. Um, but in terms of like the mechanics of it, it's quite simple. Like I am. Um, so I have a, an online platform called Presence Collective where we we do different, we have different themes every month that we explore. It's very practice based. For me, it's like, it's the, it's the integration part of everything we talk about on the podcast, which is lots of different, different people's ideas and stories and, and kind of ways of looking at the world. And then for me, it's important that we take things away from philosophy into actually embodying them and, and kind of, and, and being that which we value in the world and and so that's what we're doing with presence collective and and you know and i've been on that platform very like careful not to just keep for the sake of it making a new meditation you know actually being like let's just do the one that we were already doing because that that's all we need like it some of it's so simple like learning how to breathe and being able to slow down our breathing is it makes such an incredible difference to the quality mm. of our life of, from our health perspective, our emotional health, um, our, our kind of levels of anxiety, our ability to see clearly and uh, make decisions. And, and that's mm. as simple as taking a breath that's in for four and out for four at any moment that, that you're feeling, you know, a little bit, like before you do anything, you know, and, mm. and, and then of course it, it can go into like much more um, elaborate practices. But, but for me, yeah. it's, it's the, the, the simplicity of it is the, is the part that ideally on a, on a bigger scale, we want more and more people to be open to. For me, it's like, you know, if you choose like the path of a yogi, that's like, that's a whole different thing. And you choose to like kind of be in a certain set of set of practices and traditions and all, and all of this. Um, but that kind of understanding that we are able to shift our consciousness that, you know, we don't have to be who we've always been like that. A lot of that is our patterns. A lot of that is because of our Mm. trauma a lot of that is because she did this to me and they did that uh-huh. to me and this didn't, you know, and I didn't get this right. and now I'm like this and it's your fault. You know, yeah. how do we shift from that into, yeah, like things are, things in life are always ch- tough. Like, and, yes. 
things are always changing and there are always things that are unknown and we can't control everything. But the bits that we can control are what we put into our body, you know, from like a health perspective, like it's very simple stuff. Like, are we drinking enough water? Most of us don't drink enough water. And that really affects the way that we think, the way that we feel, the way that our organs function mm. to how do we breathe, uh, to how, how does it feel to sit quietly, to just spending like 10, 15 minutes a day with our feet on the ground. doesn't even have yeah. to be barefoot, but just outside. I've, it's like, become, a lot of it's so simple. Yeah. Sorry, Jeff. I've become, I've become aware <laughs> of all this in... So I, I knew all this in theory as I was doing the deep adaptation stuff, uh, but the, the fear uh, around coronavirus over the last month, um, I realized that I have quite a long way to go myself in how to uh, be okay with my, uh, to, to spot my own uh, emotions uh, and not act to fix them, just to notice them they're there. Uh, and I realized that that, yeah, I, I've still got quite a lot of work to do in whether it's going to be using a meditative practice or, or uh, other practices to be able to have that equanimity um, because I'm not directly affected by coronavirus just yet, but there's that sense of, of, mm. of vulnerability. And so it's really, it's really helping bring it home to me that there's that, you know, it, that, that, personal development or spiritual work that I need to do um, to be able to better be with, with the, these, these difficulties of which coronavirus is one, but there are going to be many, many more to come. Uh, and, then, and then also to find somehow some joy in the way I can be in relation to those difficulties and, how, and, and, and sort of noticing the fear response and the simplistic answer, and, but actually then going to a different place which is much more loving and caring and supportive and collaborative and inviting people also to become more uh conscious about how they respond um yeah how are you absolutely. feeling about corona yeah i mean well, so i wanted to say one thing about emotions because mm. a pure emotion only lasts 90 seconds which okay. is fascinating because if you see me after a breakup it definitely doesn't feel like it's 90 seconds. Um, but the, the actual emotion that passes through your body is 90 seconds. And then the rest of it is the story and the history and the way that it kind of connects to a deeper sense of everything. So when we really learn to work with our emotions, we're, we're able to, to just to be with them and to move them through and to, to come back into a place of equanimity. And I talk a lot about resilience and courage for this time. And for me, resilience is slightly different to the, the deep adaptation um, definition, but, but not, not too dissimilar. But it, it's, it's that kind of get, you know, picking yourself back up again. It's like that now there's coronavirus and then there's going to be more and more things. And still we're alive, you know, still our hearts are beating, still, still we're here and so how do we how are we able to integrate and move through and like re-show up every single time um and and the courage to the courage required to to be in the heart to live in the heart in amongst all of this fear and you know i think with coronavirus it's i mean it it we we had a call for presence collective and of course the question in the calls is always what's present and then everyone's like ah, coronavirus <laughs> and, um, and we had we had a kind of a, a deep conversation about it and where i've got to with it um is that there is an invitation here to take better care of ourselves and so all of the things that actually I'm talking about from drinking more water to washing our hands to being more aware of how we how our energy but actually how our physical body impacts other people's um to you know take take the right vitamins to eat well there's there's a there's a 
conversation about our immune systems in in a very very real way and that's 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 a wonderful side effect of coronavirus because mm. if that empowers us all to take better care of ourselves um then then that's then that's something that can come out of this that yeah. that is really positive and equips us better for for the present and for the future um and and also that with that with the with the panic i think people are turning a okay, well, meditation or breathing or kind of how, how can I, how can I sit with this? Um, it's, it's interesting because I'm at my parents' house at the moment and they have generally a TV on like all the time. So I went to bed last night, actually I was in the bath and there was Corona, I could hear coronavirus news <laughs> that was louder than my mantras that I was listening to in the bath. And, um, and then I, when I, when I woke up, as soon as I left my room, I heard more, more deaths and more this of coronavirus. And it's, it's a lot to, to stay centered in amongst that. And, and I, and I do feel like, you know, we, we need to, 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 you know, to, to take the invitations as they come. Okay. So there's an invitation to slow down. There's an invitation to, to take more time for, for ourselves um obviously there's a whole notion of what what people can afford to do because there's something that's sort of inherent in the whole self isolation thing that if you can afford to not have your income or if, if you if you work for yourself mm. or if you're a freelancer you know yeah. you're much more affected by these kinds of things but the fact that all these events are being cancelled and whatnot means that there aren't so many places to go um and so and so even if you're still going to work, you're, you're, there's more time um, for, for oneself. And so mm. there's, a, there's a real invitation for self-reflection in that, as well as how we do things. Uh, for me, the, the, the thing that, that scares me the most about it is the, the racism and the fear of other people that, that can yeah. arise from something like this. And I've seen that's, it in many forms already. Yeah. Even and in I, internal emails in, in organizations, which just, yeah, there's maybe yeah. some hidden latent racism there. I Amisha, mean, sorry, I want yeah. to stop you because we've, we've got some people on, on the call. Yeah. And I want to just uh, actually go to, go to them and see, see, see what questions they have for, for you. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Sorry, yeah. I can talk okay. about this stuff for a so, long time. So, um, <laughs> it's, uh, um, for those of you... Those of you on the call who haven't uh, sent uh, Matthew a question yet, um, uh, please do. And we're going to go straight to Tamara uh, Alfrof. And uh, yes, over to you, Tamara. Oh gosh, I've almost forgotten my first question. It was. I, um, it was I remind to do you. With... <laughs> Thank you. Um, I noticed when the, in January even the the British press was uh, was posting coronavirus on on the front page for solidly for two weeks and my um, my response was i'm not afraid i will not panic i do not experience fear around this um but i and i i started to post stuff on uh, my facebook threads which in which i was saying i'm not you know i'm not buying into this as a panic situation and i got quite attacked for that um but I'm wondering, so, you know, what is it that you said earlier, Amisha, that you sometimes lose touch with that inner wisdom, with your center, with your core. So my question was, when you do notice, how do you notice when you have lost your center? Because I started getting overexcited and responding and posting and, you know, got hooked in to all of the, I wasn't afraid, but I was like engaging with all of this stuff that was happening. And, and against my better judgment and I got quite attacked for being grounded and solid and you know unflappable thank you yeah how <laughs> yeah. do we how do you uh, catch yourself for me yeah. yeah yeah yeah. Thank yeah. You, yeah I mean I, I think y you can feel right when you've come out of center and um and I, I have noticed a lot of that too that for anyone that's saying because there is a mind i mean viruses are viruses but the stronger your immune system is which a, a big part of that is your kind of self-belief and you know your um the, the more fear there is in your body the easier it is for a virus to come in 
And so that's that kind of cultivating that, that love and strength and compassion. And um, that, that is one of our greatest protections. And it's, it is interesting how triggering that is for lots of people. Um, I've noticed a lot of that, that, um, you know, there's a balance, of course, of, of, um, of not putting other people in danger because you don't believe in coronavirus. But to say to yourself, like, that this isn't, I'm, you know, I'm not going to get this. Like, I'm, my system is strong and healthy and, you know, it is really powerful. And, and for me, I think that the, if you have a daily practice, it's, it's, it, it really helps in not getting off center. But we are always going to get off center because we live in a, in a world that's not centered. And so no matter, so I feel like if you're still in relationship with the world, which I, I, I personally want to be in, like I could become like a kind of spiritual ninja that's like so kind of hardcore to, to the world, but I really want to be part of this living, breathing organism and like, and to feel with everyone. But then of course that sometimes means that I will come out of myself and then I have to return to my practices and kind of come back in. Um, and, and also just, just picking our battles because it, there's, there's something about sharing wisdom, but then there's also a place where having to just argue with people like having people argue with you just because you've shared something um is really tiring uh, and i'm very lucky in the po podcast that the episodes are so long that people can't really be bothered to like argue with them <laughs> they're not like facebook posts oh ha, 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 ha. all right that's a good one how to how to, how to, how to <laughs> yourself from criticism yeah okay now Super. Oh, thank you. That's fun. Uh, Christopher, you have a question for Amisha. Um, if you unmute and, uh, and share your question. Actually, also say where you are in the world. It'd be nice to hear. Shall I unmute you or Matthew unmute you? I've, I've clicked unmute and you're, there you go. Hi, it's uh, three. We don't hear anything. In the morning here in Bulk. Uh, you can't hear me? Uh, it just, just had a delay. What you said. Okay. Um, yes, 3 ish a.m. in the morning here in Boulder, Colorado. I'm glad to be here. Um, didn't expect to be up though. So, <laughs> um, one of my questions for you is um, you know, we're trained to be consumers of everything, you know, people, workshops, stuff. So how do you deal with people come to you who want, like, what can you give me? What do I get from this? Uh, and it, it seems like myself included, I, you know, for years I wanted a special experience or, you know, something to, you know, have a lot of energy to it. And it's taken years to want to have something be a letting go or, you know, a non-experience almost is just as valuable. But anyway, how do you uh, relate or share with people who want, just want something from you? Yeah, you're talking about the commodification of spirituality as a way of adding on to one's experience of life and making oneself have more fun. And, or, or, or I think I've heard the phrase spiritual bypass as well. So rather than actually working on one shit, um, escaping, <laughs> that sort right. of stuff. Yeah. Delicia, yeah. How, are you, how are you? In, in, in yeah important stuff yeah the, and yeah it, it's definitely part of of the world that we're in and yeah this sort of spiritual bypassing or spiritual materialism where um everyone needs like the crystal and they need to go and do this and they need to do this experience and that experience and i try and really ground people into like the simplicity of it rather than um ra like so anyone that's sort of in, within like um my world like with presence collective or doing one-on-one -on -one sessions i really try and make it like that you don't have to like just go and do all these things to try it like it's it's more about committing to something than it is about um having all these big experiences and that actually that that thing that we're committing to can be very very simple as many of the things that i've said today are very simple things that anyone can do, no matter what they believe in. And one of the things that I sort of stopped 
doing retreats for a while because I started to notice that they had become part of like top up culture that was propping up the existing system. So people would come to me uh, really worn out and then we'd have this amazing week and then they'd go back and then they'd come back again next year and be like, oh, you're my lifesaver. And then I was just thinking, oh, I'm literally just helping you to go back and live exactly the same way. Um, so I've sort of shifted my offerings into more um, online and one-on-one -on -one programs, maybe visioning that coronavirus was going to mean that we were going to stop hanging out together. But, um, but, but actually the reason I did that was more because I wanted to focus on offerings that are simple that you can do at home and because it's it's the integration it's what you do that that makes the difference and and I know because I've also been to many teachers and tried this and that and had this met God in multiple different ways and I just found it really tiring by the end of it I mean it's super exciting it, but it was like but then it's like hang on this isn't having the the grounded impact and actually my values are about connecting to a simplicity and, um, and connecting more to the earth and connecting to my heart. And I, I don't need all of that in, in order to do that. So I don't know how you shift it in the whole system, but for me, what I found is that what I'm able to shift in myself or at least have full awareness of, because you know, we're human. And so even when we have awareness, it doesn't, something doesn't always completely shift because of the we're, we're in cultural conditioning and cultural patterns right as well but I find that the things that I'm paying attention to myself dramatically does shift who who's around me um, and who signs up for my programs and, and wants to to share practices and, and do sessions with me and so that's something that I've been trying to really offer in the container of, of what I'm holding yeah it's um I think this is this is key as well but it was something you said earlier about in when you were in your early 20s there wasn't really a, a community to connect to to explore and support you in your your own spirituality and and that's still the case for many people um and so yeah this question of integration or, or abiding with this consciousness in uh, over time and so yeah these these uh, we're trying to we're trying to promote that as well with the deep adaptation forum in a non commodified way um, we're trying to make sure that that every well we, we intend to make sure everything that we offer is 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 free because also otherwise we're going to see people saying are you sort of somehow commodifying people's anxieties around climate chaos um, yeah and we we really want to we our mission is to reduce harm uh, and therefore we want to just try and find ways of getting out all these kind of practices and helping people find community online or in person that yeah so it's uh Beautiful. it feels it feels massive as a thing i want i'm going to ask you a question before going back to the the uh, question from the group um when i first met you amisha you were wearing uh, a bracelet so um We'd known of each other for a while, but when we actually were face to face, you were wearing a, a bracelet of skulls around uh, your, <laughs> your wrist. And uh, I said, what's that? You know, I didn't really know. I thought you were goth or uh, into heavy metal. <laughs> he said, oh, it's Carly. And that was it. And then I, I didn't really understand what that meant. And I now know a bit more about what that means now. And, and from what you were saying earlier in our conversation about your approach to spirituality, which is very conscious of emotions, it's very grounded, it's quite earthy. You talked about earth and sky, you, um, uh, intuition, personal sovereignty. I'm, I'm one, and also talking about taking pause uh, and letting come. I'm wondering if the notion of sacred feminine uh, is, is important for you and in what way and why it matters right now in the mm. face of a climate tragedy? Well, so the tradition that I'm the most connected to um, in, in terms of my yogic path is a goddess tradition. So it, it, the, the, the kind of understanding is that the Shakti, the feminine, is like all of the energy, like everything that's moving. And the Shiva, the masculine, is kind of 
the, the unseen that's sort of holding everything. And it's kind of, it's different to the, the sense of, of the, the masculine and the feminine as the yin and the yang, um, where that, we're in that kind of model, the feminine is seen as like the, the sort of listening, like slowness, nurturing side, and the masculine is like the more, the action. Um, in, the, in the tantric worldview, it's, it's kind of, um, actually the, the masculine is more that which is holding, and the feminine is all of the energy. And um, for me, it's been very powerful to actually to study. And, and it's one of the things that I, I do actually share quite a lot of, is the mythology of the Hindu goddesses. Um, well, not just Hindu, because also Tara, um, who, who's Buddhist. But in, in the tantric world, it's kind of before before the goddesses were claimed by religions <laughs> when they just were. Um, and each of these different goddesses have, for, for me, what they are able to offer is some of the, the, it's the awakening of certain parts of ourselves. So, for example, Durga, who is the, the, the warrior goddess who rides on the lion or the tiger and she has all the arms and she has all the weapons. She for me, represents the power of love to win any battle. And it's, it's the power of love over the love of power and, um, and, and real courage and a sense of right timing as well. Like in the stories, she doesn't just like rush into every battle. She actually like cultivates like herself and she knows that she can, you know, win the battle at any moment. But what's really important for her is that she takes action at a point where it can be received and fully understood so that the karma shifts for the future. So Durga is my kind of sacred activist uh, goddess. And, um, and then Kali is, uh, is a is a favorite as well. I mean, they're, they're, you know, how can you have favorite goddesses? But um, but Carly, really to ask you this question right at the end. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I it, uh, it's hard to. Um, when, when are you doing sa- when are you doing satsang? So just so we can tell <laughs> go to amisha.co.uk maybe and get 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 a satsang about. I, I've yeah. never heard Durga explained in that way before. Yeah, uh, it well, sounds. Wow, brilliant. Well, I, no, really, I, I'm serious. I, I, I mean, I'm fairly new to all this, but I've never yeah. heard it described in, in, in that well, So I do, sh- I do share the myths a lot in Presence Collective, but also it, there's a gift section on my website and there's a, it's like free. You can listen to me sharing the story of Durga and Kali um, okay. for Navaratri and kind of what, what they mean. Um, and I think also Lakshmi, I explain, not as material abundance, but as soul radiance, the abundant nature of the soul. Um, so so I, I, for me, the, these deities, they, they offer a way of waking up parts of ourselves mm-hmm. that we need to wake up um, through story. And, and of course, they, they, they have their, their power. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and listen to you talk about those things. That's brilliant. And share with other people I know who are inquiring into this as well. Um, last question, Amisha. It's coming from Michael. If you could unmute and uh, tell us where you're joining from. Hi, yeah. I, hi, Amisha. I'm hey. from Hollywood in Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, I, I started listening to your podcast only about three weeks ago, just as they were winding up, I think. Um, and I listened to a few. And in fact, one of them was you describing. Uh, a myth of, I think it was Kali, who is chosen, picked, selected by the gods to um, uh, uh, effectively kill a king who, get, who gets a bit uh, paracrazed. Um, and uh, yeah, it's still sort of reverberating in me a bit. But um, the, the question I've got is about the series itself. Um, and presumably when you started it, you gave it the title, uh, The Future is Beautiful. P- possibly, I mean, tell me if you, you differently, um, without, as it were, the context of um, deep adaptations 
uh, attitude uh, and approach to the climate crisis and the climate breakdown. And um, I just, um, so, so what was it? I, I, th I think it's quite lovely how there is that. Um, I've, I've said tension in, in the text I've put, but actually that um, um, direct challenge to the fact that there is a climate, inevitable climate breakdown, and yet uh, you, you call it the future is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Now, Thank you, Michael. It's like that question. I think. I think the question is, where is the beauty? Yeah, where is no, the no, beauty? it's not is quite it inner, where... outer, material, cosmic. Okay. Um, yeah, where should we it's... just go for that? I'm conscious of time as well. So, can, okay, so, sorry, can, it's, it's thought can... of that question, but but yeah. is, is it is it on a personal level or is it on a a society level? Yeah. Thank okay. You. So I the this title, the future is beautiful um, is from 2016 and in four years the world has shifted in ways that we can't understand um, and it does feel like a bold um, title to be holding at this time and that has been an, an interesting journey for me I didn't know that I was walking myself into that one and um, and I stand by this that no matter what happens in the world no matter what shit hits what fans, I want to be a purveyor of beauty. I want to have a beautiful experience. And, that, and for me, beauty isn't like nice. It's, it's, it's really being connected, you know? And beauty has depth. And it's about enjoying on some level like who I am and, and the life that we have and seeing amongst whatever chaos the, the beauty that exists and there is always some and that's what's so incredible about being alive and I, I really feel like I refuse to live the rest of my life in like a anxious lockdown crisis and that no matter what happens I will seek to, um, to share the beauty in myself in in whatever scenarios we find ourselves in and and I'm, I'm happy to be supporting that as a as an idea that no matter what happens we can find beauty and there is beauty and we can share beauty and we can bring meaning and love to super to the future super absolutely and sometimes then when people say to me Jem it sounds like you're giving up I say we're not giving up we're opening up to a wider deeper agenda reduce harm, find meaning, create joy, no matter what. Uh, yeah, it's certainly, a, it's certainly a, not a turning away or withdrawing, it's a leaning into these things. Um, and so, Amisha, we come to the end. And uh, for those of you who weren't on gallery view, and those of you who just see the video, then you don't see all the beautiful faces I get to enjoy. So the beauty of these calls are often just seeing the beaming faces. So I just want to say hello Samira and Steph. I've just really enjoyed your beaming smiles throughout the call. I might just interview, uh, unmute you so you just say hello. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, there we go. Hi. Yeah, it's really, hi. I've just been, it's just the, 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 the look of uh, joy on your face as you hear things and, and nodding it's very lovely to see so I just wanted to say thank you it's so a thank you everyone beautiful rich conversation that uh, really is enlivening and uh, beneficial I feel the ripples and really appreciate the space that it's creating thank you very much and thank you everyone else for joining and thank you Amisha for joining uh, did I get your website right Amisha amisha.co.uk yeah, amisha.co.uk and Super. thank you so much this has been a really lovely it's just really lovely to spend this time with all of you and thank you yeah. for all these questions okay superb and uh i'll see uh, other people uh, all of you and people watching next month where we have sister jayanti joining bye-bye